Thanks be to God for the beauty and the power of His Word. Uh, it's been amazing to be in the, uh, the book of Hebrews, has it not? Yeah, just Gerald. I guess we'll move on to another book. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Man, I have, loved, I have loved this series, and if you got your Bible, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. That is where we're going to be. Uh, we've been in, if, if this is your first time, we've been in Hebrews since early this year. Uh, we took a small break, and then we're back in it in a Bible study kind of summer. Uh, so if you're not used to that kind of thing, uh, if you've got a phone app for the Bible, you can turn to that. We'll have the words on the screen. It's a great one to journal in as well. But I was thinking about, I mean, as you, as you hear the, the tempo of that passage, you hear, you know, all of it is going back to the past, that thousands of years before, and kind of the, the people that have led the way in faith. It's called the Hall, Hall of Faith. And I was just thinking, I was just recently looking through uh, I, like some, uh, some photos. I finally consolidated my photo library at, uh, at my house. I don't know if, if you're like me. Maybe it's just people that are uh, in their 50s that have trouble with all their electronic photos and stuff. Um, because we have things that we used when our kids were uh, younger called cameras, like actual cameras. So we have to put those in there as well. Uh, but I finally got them all, and I did kind of cave, and I you know, bought the uh, iCloud service. I know people have told me uh, to go the Google route, but... I'm just scared that I'll end up with green bubbles on my phone, uh, and that will be a horrible thing, and nobody will ever talk to me again, and I'll get pushed out of every texting stream. Um, it's okay if you're a green bubble person. We have prayer ministry for you at the end of the gathering, um, and you can turn in your Android phone uh, at the same time, and it'll be okay. Uh, but I was looking through all of these photos, and every year I notice it's like every time, you, you know, it's, it kind of organizes them. It's pretty amazing. I mean, Apple, I mean, just another plug for Apple. Uh, it's like it shows you where all of them were taken and every year for about 12 years we uh, did vacation for seven ten days uh, in Blowing Rock, Boone, North Carolina, same house. It was an amazing time uh, to do vacation. So I wanted to show you a, a photograph because I was thinking about this idea of what it's like to lead the way in faith, which faith is always associated with risk and there it is. So this is Compression Falls. Anybody been to Compression Falls? It's, it's a decent hike. Usually nobody goes there uh, that's not just crazy because the hike is crazy just to get down into this valley where this waterfall is. Not to mention that, my wife absolutely hates this place. It's beautiful, but there's copperhead snakes everywhere. Um, yeah, they come out of the rocks, and you got to be very careful, and it's, it's a little good ways to the, you got to hike out of there to go to the hospital. So um, nobody got bit while I was there, but people apparently have been bit. Um, so that's my son at the very top of the waterfall that's right there that you can barely see. This is uh, Jacob Finn that's going, I cannot believe I just did that, um, because he came down the waterfall. Uh, and what's amazing about this photo is a few minutes later, uh, Jack came down. Uh, give, give me a guess, your best guess of how far you think that is. 20? Maybe. <laughs> you would get up there and go, this is 9 million feet. Um, yeah, that, that's, yeah, 40 is a good guess. It's in between, it's like 45. 45 feet. Now, uh, some of the Navy guys that, that do the, like, the pencil dives from helicopters and do all the risky stuff said, you know, over about 30 feet, um, if you rotate forward at all in a fall into water, it can knock you unconscious. And once you get into the 40, 50 range, it's going to knock. Like, you're going to get knocked out. It's going to crack your jaw, and you're going to pass out in the water, and then somebody's going to have to embarrassingly, you know, grab you and pull you to shore with a little orange life jacket. Um, so when coming off of this, you've got you to be careful. So there's some risk to it. Now, what, what's crazy is I used to not understand, like, all of my kids, uh, and this isn't, a, I guess it is a problem, but none of them, they're just not terrified of things. Uh, they will do anything. Like, they, at amusement parks, if your kids go to, like, Disney World, I can't wait to go to Disney World, and then they're off to the side because they don't want to do Space Mountain. Never my kids. They, they always wanted to go, what is the fastest, craziest roller coaster? Let's do it multiple times. And a uh, like, ocean, never scared. Like, they, same, same way, never worried about the ocean. They'll paddle out in surf that's big during hurricane swells, all that stuff. Very proud dad. But I can't really claim credit for that fearlessness because I get nervous doing some of these things. In fact, I went off of this not because I wanted to, but because I was peer pressured. Um, and, and that's what, what happens to pastors. They get peer pressured, and people start talking about your man card, and you're like, oh, you're not going to go. Everybody else went. And, of course, I went, um, and it hurt. I rolled forward a little bit, slapped me in the face. I was like, I'm never doing that again. Here's a copperhead. Um, I just, but the, the reason that, that they are fearless, I, I give credit to the family that we always vacationed with. Um, it's the Fowler. Some of you know Antley Fowler. Uh, he's one of, my, uh, one of my greatest friends. 
Um, and you have to be really good friends to vacation together for 12 years. Like one year, you usually figure it out. It's like you go on vacation with like never again. But we would do it over and over again. But their boys and their daughter are a little bit older. Actually, their daughter was the same age as my daughter, but they, 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 they would engage. But they were just as crazy as the boys were. They were, Ella, I remember her kind of walking. The way you had to get up there was ridiculous. I mean, it was just like, Beth's like, why are you letting the children do this? I can't believe this. Um, and we did. We let them do it. Uh, but the, the older boys led the way. They always went first. This is after everybody's gone. Now, my, my oldest son, who's now 23, he was, I can't even remember how old he was there. I know Abe was about seven. So he's getting ready to go off it. But it's because Jacob Finn's gone. All the Fowler boys had gone. They led the way. They were the ones saying, you can do this. You can do this. And, and for whatever reason, my boys and my daughter, they, they trusted them. They're like, okay, well, they did it. And, and there was a little bit of that, you know, that, that risk factor pressure. Like you watch one after the other after the other. Like, well, I guess now i got to go. They kind of paved the way. There was this, this kind of rut that the Fowler boys kind of paid for my kids. And they all of a sudden, it just affected my kids in such a way that they just started to be fearless. And what the author of this passage is doing, when you, when you look at this, it's incredible because he's bringing up stories from the past that they would know. If you know anything about the book of Hebrews, if you've been with us, the, the author of this book, this is really an exhortation or a sermon. It's known as an epistle and a sermon, kind of both and, like an epistle written from an exhortation to the Jewish community at the time that was was about to go into more struggle and had been struggling and had been ejecting on their faith. And we've gotten 10 chapters of don't go back to the old system. Don't go back to your comfort zone is what we've been saying. Don't go back to the, to the, the smaller, less significant saviors, the ones at the end of the day that are fragile at best. And certainly don't go back to the temple system. It was there and had its purpose as an illustration. It was a shadow reality of the cross, the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate advocate, the ultimate savior, Jesus Christ. He, is the, he became one of us, but he was the, the, the better one of us. And he was the better savior. Better, so no more system. Now a savior has come. That's been Hebrews. And now in 11, he's saying, now live by faith. And let me, let me, let me explain to you what faith is. And the author beautifully and wonderfully begins to unpack what faith is. And I think sometimes flippantly, because we grew up in the Southeast, we feel like we know and understand what faith is. You know, faith is what's associated with what we do as Christians. We, you know, we live by faith. That's what we're doing. We're living by faith. Yes, what is faith? He heard me say it, and he's just like, that's the first, that's the first question we're going to answer. As we dig into this today, we're going to answer three questions. The first one is, what is faith? Okay? What is faith? I think we want to unpack what that is and what it looks like to have, you know, to have faith. The second thing we're going, to, we're going to unpack is why does faith please God? If you didn't notice while Abby was reading, why does, why does faith please God? That's an odd thing that we see that in Scripture when we think about the gospel. Some of you are kind of tracking with me like there's something that I can do that makes God happy with me. When we think about the gospel... We always talk about the idea that, that our sins past, present, and future, the, the, the bad track record, the, the, the track record of guilt and shame is annihilated by the cross of Jesus Christ. That I have eternal approval. Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is all about the fact that we've been, we now belong, that we've been adopted, not because of what we've done, but by faith, through, or by grace, through faith, Right? Not of works, not like anything we've done. So this is saying, okay, there's something that we can do in our faith to please God. I certainly want to understand how that coexists with the gospel, meaning you didn't do anything. God did everything. That your approval is not, doesn't hinge on your actions. Your approval by God hinged on the righteousness of Christ. He walked perfectly on your behalf, took your sin and shame. You got to trade records with Jesus. You didn't do anything to please God. Jesus did that with his sacrifice on the cross. So what is this talking about when it says faith is the way that we can please God? Because I certainly want to know how to please the creator of the universe. And then why does this matter to us? This is a question we answer every week. It's 2024. We're reading an ancient text that's talking about an even more ancient story. How does that actually become relevant to us? How does God's living and active word become relevant to us? Why does any of this 
matter. All right, so if you got your Bible, Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 1, what is faith? Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So right away, if you were with us last week, there's a word in there. I want to see, this is quiz time. Nine didn't get the quiz, but y'all get the quiz. Sorry, you're, you, you came to the later gathering. They got no quiz. You're getting a quiz. So what word up there was very prominent in chapter 10? Look at you. Y'all get the gold star Sunday school. Confidence. Confidence is in there. Now, faith is confidence. Now, what the, the, the bolstering of confidence that chapter 10 gave us was, came from not just that, that we had access to God because of Jesus, but now we also have access and, uh, anybody? Advocate. Shelly, you are on staff. I heard you. Oh, it was you. Just as bad. Just as bad. You're up here singing. Of course you know, you know. You've been to Sunday school. Access and advocate. So confidence. Like So, yeah, if we had the math equation, access and advocate equals confidence. That's what he's saying. So now faith is this confidence, like this foundation that we have. Like we walk in with that, that what? That holy swagger now that we've got. Not, not, not arrogance, but like a, a child that knows that their dad can get things done. And he owns the place. So when we walk into his store, we know we, we, we're all good. I know the owner. And that's the idea that not only do we have access to, to God and we can boldly approach the throne, but we have an advocate. We, we, are, we are in relationship with the one that, that did it all, that owns it all, that is for us in every situation. So now faith is confidence in what we hope for. So we got to understand what hope is because this, this idea is, is tied to assurance. It says hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Hope in, in the world, in the way that we operate on planet, like when we think about worldly hope, in the English language, hope is a lesser word than what we see here. I mean, best example is like, you know, I hope it doesn't rain. Actually, I hope it does rain. We, we need rain around here, right? Uh, but you hope. Like it's not rooted in anything. You just, I hope FSU wins. That's the way I'm, you know, I'm wired. When we get to the fall, I hope they win every game. Now, is there any basis in that? Well, yeah, they're awesome. But other than that, other than the fact that I'm a fan and I'm in, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's a different type of thing. We, we look at hope differently, you know? It's like, I hope she likes me, um, which is bad news for a lot of guys because she doesn't. Um, but you've got, you've got this, this idea of hope. But here, there's assurance. So what is this? Like, John Piper says hope is really a subset of faith. Hope is, is future faith. Because it's looking down the road. Like faith looks back. It looks in the moment to have faith so that we could risk in the moment. And hope is looking forward that we know that there's a glorious future. Just as, as Eric said, I think he said it at the nine. Like, you know, Jesus, there's a, there's a hope for us. That even if we're going through it, like Gerald and Abby and, and Megan were leading us this morning. It was like this idea, look, healing is possible. But we don't know when. But we know at some point, like if we, if we believe what we believe, we have this assurance that every tear will be wiped from every eye, that everything will be restored. Some of us on this side of heaven, some of us on the other side. Like I talked about, you know, Brett Wintrow was in just worshiping like crazy in, in the, the first gathering. That guy should not be alive. All the doctors told him, you, years ago, you're going to be dead from cancer, riddled in your body, in your bones like speckled spots of cancer everywhere. And now it's gone. And they don't know why. I know why. We prayed for Brett every week. And now his cancer's gone. And he sits here going, that healer thing, I get that. Like you wonder why somebody's jumping up and down and worshiping, screaming and getting excited. Some of those, you're know, like, this is a weird church. Well, if getting healed from cancer is weird, then you're in the wrong place. Because we like that. We think that's amazing. So that's the assurance. That's a different kind of hope. Right? A future hope that we trust that the God that we're following in faith has something for us down the road. And that's what the author here is getting to. So as we're understanding, this faith is, is, is there's a fullness to it. It's not lightweight. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now I love this because this... This, this got a little bit of a science feel to it. Like he's talking about the universe. In Hebrews chapter 1, it really jumps into that. It almost images and mirrors Colossians chapter 1, this idea of who, who God is. That he, everything, that Jesus is the active force in creation. 
Like Jesus wasn't just this momentary person that plopped down on planet earth and walked like the, the delivery guy that had to go, you know, die on the cross and God was up there. Well, I got to send somebody down there to pay for all these. No, God sent himself. Jesus was around at the time of creation. By the word of his mouth, he, he holds stars in place. That's what, what, what Hebrews says. So when we read this, it's kind of a throwback. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. How did he form it? Well, he formed it out of nothing. Nobody's ever made anything out of nothing. A painter always had paint and canvas. God did it out of nothing, out of nothingness. Scientists, people have tried to create things like create single-cell organisms, tried to bring things to life. Nobody can create life. Everything that we see was formed out of nothing by God. Now, what's crazy about this, as we start to think about faith, it made me think about this idea of dark matter. I don't know, like, because I think sometimes we think about faith being blind faith. Like, when people make fun of Christianity, and they do, I mean, there's people out there just think it's, it lacks intellect. They think, okay, faith is, faith is blind. Like it's, but faith is not blind faith. Faith is not a blind leap into a dark room hoping that there's a floor. There's a foundation. We believe in God. We believe that there's, the, in the person of God, in the person of Jesus, there is a foundation. There is a solid foundation under our feet. We're believing that God has a glorious future. It's not foundationless and like, ah, maybe, maybe not. There's evidence, and it says this, it says there's understanding. And the reason I love this whole idea is that he mentions the universe and that God, at God's command, that out of nothing, out of what is not seen, God made everything. Like everything was made. And when I, when I, when I think about science, back in 1933, it was a scientist, everybody thought he was a little bit odd. Because he said, there's something out there that's invisible. And, and there's, this, there's, I, there's something that, like, we, we think that gravity is what keeps us all together, right? And it partly does. Like, if you look at the universe, you see the earth and you see the moon. What keeps the moon in its, you know, spherical rotation around the earth? Gravity, right? What keeps Derek on the stage? Gravity. Like, there's a, the, the mass of an object the greater mass wins. If you know anything about gravity, the greater mass wins. So the earth is bigger than the moon, so the moon is caught into the tractor beam of gravity of the earth. The earth rotates around the sun. Why? Because the mass is bigger. So the other bodies that are circling around the sun, their mass is smaller, and there's other things that can end up in the gra gravitational pull of planet earth. We've got satellites, we've got you know, meteors, that are, there's things that are floating crazy, you know, thousands of miles an hour <laughs> around the earth because of gravity. So scientists prior to 1933 and prior to really 2011 is when they confirmed this. So it took a long time before they confirmed this. They thought, okay, the way that the universe is held together besides the fact that it's expanding is gravity. Like everything's caught in a traction or pull. Well, this one scientist in 1933 back then, he observed through a telescope a system outside of the solar system that was like, he's like, there's no way based on mathematics and the size of the objects that they should be held together but they're being held together. All of it should blow apart. The math wasn't even close to working out. He's like, this system has, it's, I don't know what's holding it together. Like, there, there's no reason that it should. I'm not going to try to explain that because I don't really understand the math behind it either. But his proposition was it can't be just what we know about the, the laws of gravity because that's sure and good. It's a foundation. He says there's something else called dark matter. This thing that's holding things together in the universe. Like there's this thing that, that we, don't, we can't quite know. But we, they, so observing dark matter started in, in 1933 and then about 2011. And I'm weird, so I read a NASA article and this just blew me away. I was like, they basically confirmed dark matter. They're like, we've done enough observation. We've seen how it acts based on deep field telescopes that we know. And this is the statement that I read on the NASA website. We know that there's something all over the universe that we can't see that's holding all things together. Let me repeat that. We know that there's something in the universe that we can't see that is holding all things together. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, over heaven, over earth. In Him, all things, what? They hold together. 2011, the world of science is just figuring this out the Apostle Paul and the author of Hebrews, they already know. 
that there's an unseen force in the universe that is holding all things together. And what I love about this is that's under, they, they have something that they can't see, but like it says here, it says in verse 3, by faith we understand. This is in the mind. We look at faith as blind faith, and I think sometimes people are like void of intellect. Oh, that is just a bunch of bunk. Like there's no intellect in, in faith. No, it starts with understanding. It starts with this idea that we, we begin to see, and here's, here's what scientists, this is how they figured out this invisible force. They watched, they, they, they saw there was something that was impacting all of the things that they could see around it. It was unseen, but they could see what it, how it acted, how it behaved, how it reacted, how it was held together. And they knew there's something there. And I love that, that that's faith, that we begin to understand, we begin to see, we begin to observe each other in community, we begin to observe. Most of you people became Christians because of somebody else that impacted your life. 93% of the people that become Christians don't walk an aisle in a church. It's relationship. They're watching somebody else. And they're watching them maybe sinful and broken, but so for some reason, there is something about that family. I don't know what it is. It's like, it's like a star shooting across the universe. There's something. What is it that they're holding on to? They're not arrogant. They're not prideful. But they've got something. They believe in something. I don't know what it is. And, and all of a sudden, what is it? The trajectory. Somebody becomes a Christian as a result of somebody else's relationship. They're, they're watching that invisible force of God and their faith. And it's the thing that they begin to understand and leads them to belief. Because the, the beautiful thing about this is like Tim Keller says it this way. He says, faith begins with understanding. It begins with reasoning. It doesn't, it's like, it's not blind in the way that we're like, okay, just check your intellect at the door with Christianity. Because I, I know there's people in here that, that, you, that would drive you crazy. The rest of you, I don't know. I'm kidding. I think all of you are smart. I'm just saying, there's, there's people in here that that's the, that's the side of, of Christianity that, that drew you in. It wasn't just this thing. It's like, okay, you know, you know Christianity, yeah, that's, that's, it's going to be foolishness to those who are perishing, so you just have to check your brain at the door and follow something blindly that just seems stupid to everybody else. Well, that's just a misrepresentation of Scripture. Because faith begins with understanding. We see it here in verse 3. But it leads to conviction. So you begin to understand, and then all of a sudden you, you realize, oh, this is a foundation I can stand on. There's conviction. I believe this. I believe there's dark matter. I believe there's this invisible force that's holding all things together. And you can believe it too. So then there's, there's a conviction. Like I, I've stepped over. I can now actually take that risk. I can jump off of the waterfall. I've seen somebody else do it. I see somebody down there telling me, this is where you jump. I've watched over and over again. I've seen them do it. I'm going to be okay. There's a conviction. I'm all in. Over the falls. Into this thing. And then finally, there's conviction and then there's commitment because this isn't faith in a chair because I believe the chair will hold me up and I haven't sat in it yet but if I sit in it I'm pretty sure I'm watching Gerald sit in it and I've started to build my faith I have some understanding I'm pretty convicted about that chair I'm gonna go sit in it I know that it's gonna hold up but that's a chair that's an object faith is faith not in a thing but the person of the person of Jesus it's faith in God so with that, it's like, okay, there's something to follow. There's something to commit to. So it doesn't just go from understanding to conviction. There's a commitment. I'm, com I'm committing myself. If that's the person that runs everything, that spoke everything to, into existence, if that's the invisible force that holds the whole world together, then I'm following. And I believe it by faith. Convicted that I'm going to commit fully to that. I'm all in. That's more than just saying, I believe. I think we flippantly just say, I believe in this. And the reason that the author is saying that, he's like, hey, when all of a sudden tragedy comes, when all of a sudden persecution comes, when, when the road starts to go down into the valley and things get a little harder, if, if it's just I started to understand something and, you know, I attend church, but, you know, I'm kind of moving around. There's, there's a lack in our generation of that last part of faith. It's the, you know, we might understand, there might be a little bit of conviction, but there certainly isn't any commitment. But that matters. 
Because that's true faith. I mean, I have one of the worst and best illustrations I've ever done in my life, preaching. My early days of preaching back in 2008. I was at River City Church, night, a night service. You can do pretty much anything at a night service, especially because it's all young people. So I, uh, I asked this question, and some of you have heard this illustration before. I think I've, I've said it, but I've used it in a different way. Um, I, I pinned a really big balloon to a wall, uh, a little pegboard um, on stage, about 12 feet away from me, and I had a pellet gun, um, and I pumped it 12 times, and you know, people from the southeast and a lot of rednecks in the room, they knew you pump it 12 times, it's, it's you know, it's pretty powerful. Uh, so got the balloon over there, and I basically said, and they knew, I'm a good old boy from southeast, and you know, my dad, you know, went to the Citadel, my you know, father-in-law, two tours of Vietnam, he probably can shoot. Um, and so they just, 100% of, I said, can I shoot that balloon from 12 feet away? 100%. I believe it. Nobody in the room. Everybody said, Derek can shoot the balloon. And then I said, okay, let's see if we got a little bit of conviction here. And I said, all right, who wants to hold the balloon instead of being pinned to the wall? Um, and there was 10 idiots that came up there uh, to hold the balloon. And this is where the illustration went, went poorly. Uh, because I could have ended and not had to fire a gun. Um, but I had to, um, no, and then I said, okay, okay, we got a little bit of conviction, but are we, are we going to get to some commitment? Um, who, if you really believe, like already, already most of you have bailed. You said you believe, but you really didn't believe, right? Um, 10 of you still in, still going to heaven. Um, you're up here and you say you believe. And then I said, who wants to hold it in their teeth? I mean, if you really believe, what's the difference, Right. You said you believe. I can shoot the balloon. I'm not going to hit you. I'll hold it in my teeth. And so at that point, it was supposed to be zero. But Nicholas, Nicholas said he would hold it in his teeth. I don't know if he thought he was going to get like a special ribbon in heaven or something. Like, I'm going to be my faith. I'm going to live. I'm holding my teeth. Um, and Nicholas, and you should have seen our, our, the, the administrator in our church was there that night. Uh, older lady, she was sitting over there kind of near where all this is taking she, the moment I brought a gun on stage, she was just like oh gosh, what's going to happen in here um, and then yeah, so it, it's I didn't, I ended up shooting Nicholas um, I'm kidding, I didn't, I didn't I didn't shoot Nicholas, I didn't fire the gun I kind of made, I was like, oh well this is going poorly, thank you Nicholas um, and you did, I didn't know how to die well like I know how to die pretty well now uh, in preaching, I've done it a lot um, but then it just, it just everything went, went south from there. But you get the point. Like we say that we believe, but do we really? Because when it comes down to it, you start to get a little bit of like turbulence. It starts to get a little shaky. It's like looking at the platform and you're like, okay, that's a few stories up. And it looks like fun. They're going to bungee jump from up there. You're like, do you believe that platform will hold you? Yes, I believe it will hold me. That's what it looks like. I start, that thing has been there for 30 years. That thing will definitely Hold me. That bungee thing, I've seen 19,000 people go boing boing, and that boing boing looks fun. And then you get up on the platform, what happens? You start to see things, and you start to get up there, and you look down, and you're starting to see really, and it's like, I believe, you don't believe anymore, you start shaking. And then there's a lot of people that walk out there, nope, not doing it, that walk up there after saying they're all in. What is that? Well, you, you said you believe, but when it came down to it, the, there was the conviction, maybe there just wasn't enough people that <laughs> had jumped off and gone, you know, the boingy boingy didn't look that fun from up there after, after that, right? There's the understanding. And I think we got a lot of people that, that understand, and what a great thing that faith is not just this blind thing, that there's some understanding to it. We get to see the, the reaction. We get to see the, the physical nature of planet earth Romans 1 says we we see things everything that we see is a representation that God exists that he's real that he breathed everything out into existence how did it all get here there's one really really good explanation a sovereign creator created it but then there's conviction but finally there's like there's commitment I'm in I don't just believe a little bit I don't just have a little bit of conviction but I'm I'm holding the balloon with my teeth I'm in this. I believe that he is good. Even though this might not look great, looks a little bit sketchy, I'm in. It's a beautiful thing. So the second question, so I think we get, get in the faith thing, understanding, conviction, and commitment. But how does faith please God? Look at verse 4. It says, by faith Abel brought God a better offering than Cain. By faith he was commended as righteous. 
when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. Uh, some of you know this story really well if you grew up in church, the story of Cain and Abel. Um, two sacrifices. These are, this is one generation away from Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve booted out of the Garden of Eden. Now you've got Cain and Abel, the offspring of Adam and Eve. Um, some of you know this story. Abel gives the better sacrifice. He's the sheep herder, and uh, Cain is the, the farmer. He brings just his pick through of his fruit and vegetables before God. And God says, hey, Cain sacrificed good, Abel's, or uh, Cain sacrificed bad, Abel sacrificed good. He brought the, the better one. And if you just read the Genesis account, in Genesis chapter 4, you can write that in your margin if you're doing Hebrew study with us as we're kind of working through Hebrews. Right, Genesis chapter, go, go read the story. Um, or John Steinbeck's East of Eden. It's, you know, kind of a little take on Cain and Abel, right? Um, you, you, get, you get into it, and you're, there's a lot of focus on Cain, actually, in this. It's like, there's not a bunch. It's like, Abel just did the right thing. And then, here, look at all the things that Cain did. Here's how Cain lived. It's like, sometimes God's, you know, he's just a good parent. Like, sometimes, as a parent, I just got you to teach a lesson. You look at the bad kid. You're like, see that bad kid? See what he's doing in Target? Don't do that. Like, you, sometimes that's what you have to do. And that's kind of the way it's written in, in Genesis chapter 4. But, but when you read Hebrews, you realize it wasn't what Abel did. It was more at the heart of the matter. It was the heart. It was that Abel was all in. He didn't just understand who God was. He didn't just have conviction. He, he was fully committed. The best of my best of my best when it comes to what I've done in my job, working, my best sheep. That's what's going to be sacrificed to God because I trust him. Even though this is, this is, this is a, a deal for me. It's financial. It's all, there's a whole lot to it. My best. And Cain just didn't bring his, his thing was, you know, can I make it look good enough to where God digs it? And thought he had done pretty good. But God knew. It was all about the heart. God was not looking for the, the earning. You can't earn. Like this idea of pleasing God is not earning his favor. But that doesn't mean that there's not works and things that, that happen outside of that. This is all about faith. It's the belief. It's the trust. And you see that as you, you keep going in verse 5. Uh, we get to the story of Enoch. Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. This is a great story. I mean, this is fantastic. Dude just disappears. Like the death rate is what? Anybody know what the death rate is? For, for the human race? Anybody? 100%. 100%. Thank you, mathematicians in here. Like, well, I just think everybody dies eventually, right? It's 100%. But this dude, he, he wrecks it. Like, he doesn't die. And what's crazy, you read it. How, does anybody know, like, in the, just even, I, I'll give you a, a shot. It, how old was, was Enoch when God took him up, just said, I, we're just taking him because he's living by faith and I like him? 365. 365 years old. And he was middle-aged for that time. I mean, read the Bible. It's so crazy. It's awesome and fun to read. And this story is Crazy, because it's like the blip in the radar. You've got, by faith, Abel, by faith. By, you get, it's like all of a sudden you hit Enoch. Let me stop for a second. This dude was so faithful, and whatever he did along the way, God just said, I want to hang out with him more. He just took him. I mean, it's just all of a sudden he's, he, I love the, the way that it says it. Some of your translations, and he was no more. I mean, I just love that. He's just gone off planet Earth. Um, and it, it continues, it says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. He's saying that it is something to believe in an invisible God. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. We continue. We're kind of putting together the picture that this is all about faith and not works. It's about trust and belief. Like, God, the, the pleasing part is not like... I've, I, I went on, you know, this person went on four mission trips, and I've been on seven, and I an anchor, and I'm in kids, and they're going to ask me to lead a city group. Well, your sacrifice is worthy, and you've pleased God. Your three mission trips, I'm sorry, you didn't make it. No pleasing God for you. No, it's about the heart. It's about faith. It's, it's the idea of trust. Do I trust? Have I gone all in saying, I believe that he is the king of the universe. I believe that I can't do it on my own. He, 
It continues, by faith Noah, it's represented right here, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. Now, if you know the context of this, Noah, this was humiliating. Like people are like, what are you doing, Noah? Like 120 years of building an ark, a boat, that nobody needed. Everybody's looking going, what is he doing? You know, and everybody's living wicked, and Noah's sitting back going, I got some holy fear of God. I mean, that's just a side sermon today. Like, that's a lost thing, and it's all across Scripture, the idea of holy fear. Like the way that we act, the way that we talk, the things that we watch, all of the stuff. There, I, I think we should shudder a little bit more and look up. I mean, there's just something to that. Noah had that type of faith. Like, I believe God is big. I believe God has created everything. He is sovereign and can squash me at any time that he wants. And he's looking at everybody else going, he's, he's pretty much told me that he's going to squash everybody else but me, so I'm going to build a boat. And for 120 years, didn't worry. Didn't worry about the mockery. Didn't worry about the shame. Didn't worry about everybody getting weirded out by it. He's like, I'm building a boat. And good thing he did is that he was the only, everybody else flushed the toilet on everybody else. And Noah and his boys were the only ones that survived. And some of the animals, two by two, right? But it was his belief. It was his belief. And the, the, the sum total, I've never put these things in the same bucket. If we're talking about how God's pleased, you see this very well represented in Scripture. That faith is the moment where we say, oh, it's not about me. It's about Him. Because we want to control everything. We want to, the essence of the Garden of Eden is the moment when Adam and Eve decided that they didn't believe God. They lost their faith. And what did they believe in? They wanted to be their own God. They wanted to be the captain of their own ship. They wanted to build their own identity. They wanted to be their own person. They thought they knew better. That was the, that was the sin. I mean, we always look at sin as, man, that is really bad stuff. It's dark and woo. But the, the root of that dark stuff is, I believe I know what's better. I believe I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. Or looking at the Bible. I mean, at this time in 2024, this happens all the time. People are now looking at the Bible going, this doesn't feel good to me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to either decide I don't really believe all of the Bible or I'm going to just, which eventually means you're going to eject on your faith altogether at some point. But it's the, this part, I just, can we take this part out? Or even though it's not ambiguous in Scripture, people going, it's God, this is different. This is not what God, God would never do that, even though it's across the entire landscape of Scripture. And it says it very, very clearly with just not, I mean, you can't read it any other way. But it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Like, the, just the idea of identity. Everybody wants to create their own identity. This is my identity. This is what I, people can't tell me what I am. I decide what I am, and I can be whatever I want to be. And Scripture does not say that. You are an image bearer of God. Your identity was not created by you. You don't come up with it. And what a, what a, what a burden for somebody on planet Earth to carry. I've got to create identity for my, the freedom of going, my identity is in Christ. I am approved of, and I belong to something way better than any club, any little identity marker I can put on myself, anything I can create for myself. I belong to the church of Jesus Christ. I am a believer. I mean, that is a whole different thing. And so you've got this, he is greater than me. He is greater than me. That is faith. The moment where we're, we're heading back in repentance to the garden where everything was, where it's supposed to be, where I'm fully dependent on God. I finally stepped out off the ledge into the arms of God to say, you are the one that has this, rather than deciding, I'm, I don't know. I mean, we've stopped being risky Christians in my, in my, I mean, just, I feel like that's, and I'm not, this is not, this is me thinking globally, thinking especially in the United States and in the West. We live pretty comfortable. What happens when this all goes away? Are we going to be, are we going to just, you know, we all raise our hands, say we believe, and then all of a sudden there's 10 of us, and then all of a sudden there's just Nicholas. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I feel like there's, but, but faith is this humble move of saying, not me, but him. He's the one that is the foundation of my faith. It's not about what I can control, 
what I believe. It's full surrender. It's walking the aisle in humility, not looking around the room going, I wonder what so-and-so thinks. I've been a Christian for 30 years. I've led that guy in a Bible study, and he's probably going to look at me funny that I'm in tears and confessing sin or walking the aisle because I need healing or because my marriage is falling apart. That's faith. That's stepping out on a ledge. Letting the words come out of men. Being able to say, I need a Savior. Not that women don't struggle with that, but you struggle with it less than, than men. Men don't want to say, I need to be saved. It's not, we, all, we make it about manliness. We are desperate. If anybody, the men in this room, including me, somebody rescue me. Who will rescue this body of death? And if the Apostle Paul, who was manlier than all of us, could say that, we can. We can. We need to be able to say these things, and we have to say them by faith. It pleases God when we trust Him. I mean, that's the way we are as parents. We, we, when my kids would jump into my arms when they couldn't swim by the pool, nothing made me... It's not that... That I, I still was going to love them unconditionally, but I certainly was pleased when they, when they were standing on the edge going, and they're just shaking, looking back at mom, shaking, you know, wondering if I'm going to catch them. And of course I didn't. I was like, they need to learn how to swim. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I always caught them. But it, it was pleasing. Trust. Please, it pleases God. It's, what, it's the whole essence of faith. We are saved by faith, not by works. It's believing. He's so excited when we, when we step in, when we raise our hands, or we come forward and say, I want to be baptized. I want to, I'm in this. And that, that leads us to, to why does this matter? You know, why does, why does any of this, what does this matter for us? I think we're, we're feeling in the room, there's people in here that you need this, this idea of living by faith. I mean, if you read that scripture, so many of them died without realizing the promise, right? So many of them were, were in that. But the beauty of seeing all of them, it's like the Fowler boys. There was a place called Snake Pit that we used to jump off this thing. It was like 25 or 30 feet down. And it was scary too. It's like I jumped off that too like an idiot. But they would jump in it and they're like, okay, there's a hole right here. It's this big and there's water all around. You don't see the rocks underneath. They're like, well, you got to jump right here. If you jump over here, you're going to break your leg or your back or something. So you don't want to jump over there. Over here, same. Here, definitely going to, your knee's going to be destroyed. Jump right here. So you'd be like, oh, great, that's awesome. So they would literally stand down there and be like, all right, Jack, right here. You just jumped. I just did it. I just came in. Just jumped right here. You're all good. And they would do it. They would jump in that tiny little spot because they're showing, the, they're leading them and showing them the way. It's such a powerful thing. We, we're not the first. The author's going, you're not the first to live by faith. So many have done this. And they did it without fully realizing the promise. It's like an architect that's laying the foundation for something that's going to take six centuries to build. That's the cathedral at Milan. Six centuries. And there's probably, I think it was like 250 different architects, but the original planner was in 1300. It didn't finish until 1965. Didn't get to, to realize it. And he knew. But he laid the plans and laid the foundation. These guys laid the foundation and they're pointing to us going, you can jump here. You can jump here. We lived our whole life. We even died still having faith. And they're, they're the Faith Hall of Fame. That's the cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on. It's pretty powerful. Why does this matter to us? I mean, these people had no resurrection and no Jesus at the time. I mean, future Messiah. We got both. We got both and evidence for it. If you read verse 13, why does this matter? All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Foreigners and strangers on earth. These people continued to go. They left their home country. Abraham left his home country knowing he could have gone. But if he all of a sudden quit believing, he would have gone home. He was from a wealthy, wealthy, wealthy family. And he lived in, it says, they, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they lived in tents. And they, they didn't get to see the, the full kingdom, you know, the, the whole realization of the, the people of Israel. They didn't go from that small tribe to two million people that we see in Exodus. They died without 
realizing and recognize that promise in verse 50 to say they still they didn't receive I just want to say does anybody feel that way like you're in the middle of something and you haven't received what what you feel like was promised you I just want to say you weren't the first you weren't the first so many people if you think Christianity is about if I get in the pool with God and I do the things with whatever then I'm gonna this is all gonna get I'll, I'm, I'm gonna finally have that relationship that I want or this sickness will finally go away can he heal you can he lead the right man to you or woman to you? Absolutely. Could there be another season of the unknown? Absolutely. These people died, but they still had faith because they knew there was another. They were foreigners in a strange land. This is not your home. That we get the opportunity, the excitement to live by faith and not by sight. This is your only opportunity. I didn't say this at nine, but I want to say this very clearly. You have one shot at this. One shot to live by faith. You are born. You are going to live. There's going to be a little thing on your, your, your headstone. This is when he was born, and this is when he died. And I'm telling you, that is a micron. That is a dot on the radar. And you get an opportunity to leverage and please God by faith in those margins. But once you see Jesus, and whether you're a Christian or not, you are going to see him face to face. Faith is over. You won't need it anymore because you will be seeing him. You will know that he holds it all together with his fist and with the word of his, with, with his, of his hand. You will know in that instant. But right now, OCC, we have an opportunity to risk and live by faith and say, you know, all this stuff I put my hope in, it doesn't matter that much. He matters way more. He matters way more. No more, I believe and I understand a little bit and a little bit of conviction and no commitment. That is, that is 2024 in a nutshell. That is, I don't know. I don't know. I'm hurt. I'm going to move. I'm going to go here. I might go to watch church online a little bit. It's fine. Commit. If you're not committed here, commit somewhere. Be in together. That's what this was. The, the author of Hebrews is like, we're a family. We're all together in this. Look, you've got a lineage of faith, and these people died without fully realizing just a powerful representation for you and for me. We have to step out. We have to risk. We have to know that He is for us. It's so, it's so exciting to think about what's possible if we believe. And God tells us to ask, like shamelessly. Like I think we're sometimes embarrassed to ask. We're in the, the cringe culture. You know, everything's with millennials. It's like, it's so cringy. Can't do that. It's like everybody's worried about getting, somebody took that picture of me in those shoes, and I can't believe that. It's terrible. That was, the picture was like from seven years ago. I can't believe they put it on the internet. It's cringe. Everything's cringy. We need to be shameless, because there's going to be so many things that people are going to say, it's just, we're scratching the surface now. But being a Christian is going to get tougher and tougher. I am convinced. People are, I mean, Cancel culture. It's like people want to try to cancel everybody. Right? It's like everybody's getting, I don't know how they can cancel us though. It's no, nobody's famous in here. It's like it's, Hollywood can get canceled as you're no longer on TV. I'm not on TV. It doesn't matter. Can't cancel me. Right? Can't cancel you either. None of you are famous. Maybe somebody in here is. I have no idea. Can't cancel Jesus. Jesus cancels things though. Cancel death. Right? And that's who's holding us. That's who we're committing to. You know, I have this picture of uh, my, uh, my youngest son. I think he was six or seven. Um, I didn't show the nine. You, the 11 is great. So you need to tell those people at nine that like pack the house. They, they, they get, you get way, way more shorter sermons because I'm, I'm long, but not as long as I was there. There's a climbing that wall. Now, I, somebody had a heart attack looking at this and like, I'm a terrible parent letting him do that. Like, he, do you know what he could, like he has no helmet. He is like, you know, 2024 is like, you know, he should have body suit, you know, body armor, you know. Um, but he's flying with just that rope. But what you don't see in the picture is behind that rock is me. And I'm there and I'm, I'm cheering him on. I'm terrified, but I'm not telling him. But I'm so excited because I told him he was nervous to go up there and he's getting ready to go up there to the corner of the big waterfall and his mama's mad at me and but I'm there and I'm cheering him on and I'm like you're gonna be okay you're gonna be okay you're good and 
I, and I, I just want to say this. Let's, let's stand together. I just want to say this. You're going to be, some of you have walked in and it's not okay, doesn't feel okay, and I just want to say you're going to be okay. I think Jesus and God is speaking over, over you right now, that you can trust him. You can put your life with him. You can believe him. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He is trustworthy and good. How will he not give you all things? He is good. He is good. God, we love you. We love who you are. We love your word. We love that it leads us time and time again to the truth. It leads us away from ourselves, which is a disaster, and leads us to you, who are beautiful. God, just come and change our heart, change our mind. In Jesus' name.